All right, welcome to the studio of G Networking Hour. Today we're going to be talking about Traction, um, which is a great book about how to get customers. Um, we talk about this a lot, different types of innovation, um, and that to have an innovative business, you don't necessarily need to innovate on all fronts. Really, just one of these three will be enough. So you've got value creation, just classic product service innovation. Value capture is some innovation around the business model that we've talked about in past weeks. And then the last one is value promotion, so unique ways of getting customers, and that's what we're going to talk about today uh, with this Traction Talk. It's based on a book by Gabriel Weinberg and uh, Justin Mars, um, Startup Guide to Getting, getting Traction. And this is an older edition. There's a newer one uh, that's blue, but they're, they're pretty much the same book. So what is Traction? You guys have heard this term, like when a startup gets traction, what, what do they mean? Getting started, kind of just, you know. They get a foothold yeah. to be able to move themselves forward. So. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so, perfect. Exactly, yeah, so traction is a sign something working. Something is working. If you charge for your product, customers are buying. If your product's free, your user base is growing. So the reason traction matters is that traction is the best way to improve the odds of startup success. Everything gets easier with traction, and what they say a lot in the book is traction trumps everything. So if you're going to go raise money, uh, bring on partners, get loans, anything like that, if you've got traction, you've got money coming in, you've got uh, a growing user base, all that becomes easier. What the authors did was they spent um, a couple years, I think they both were coming off successful startups, and they spent, I think, like three years trying to just do some research on how all these businesses, how businesses get customers, basically, because they figured out that was basically their key to success, was all these different channels for how they got customers. Um, and so they broke it down into 19 ways businesses get customers, and they go through different strategies for each of these in the book. And they also put together a bullseye framework, which is a way to select the proper traction channels for your business. Um, so the first step in the bullseye framework is to brainstorm reasonable ways to use each, each one of these traction channels, so these 19. Um, you don't want to miss, dismiss any channels at this step. You want to consider all of them and actually think through how those would be implemented for your business. How could you possibly use that? Um, then eventually you're going to rank these in the three columns. Some will rise to the top. Those will be the best picks, the, your inner circle, some potential ones, and some long, long shots. You want to prioritize to the top three traction channels for your business. Then you test them. And not like spend a ton of money to really roll these out. Test these on a small scale to see if they work um, incrementally um, with small tests. You know, if it's running some ads on Facebook to see if those convert effectively or any of these other traction channels. Just test them out, see how they work. They should show, um, Ideally, one of them will show promise, and if that's the case, then you're going to focus on that promising channel. If none of them show promise, then you revisit the, the list and, and, and go back. Maybe pick some of your potential ones. All right. Any questions on the bullseye framework? It's pretty straightforward here where you just look at all the, the 19 channels, see how it works for your business, prioritize the top few, test it, see what works. If not, get it right. Um, this quote, again, kind of underscores the importance of uh, traction and uh, these different channels for getting customers. This comes from Peter Thiel. He was an early investor in, in, in Facebook. Um, he was one of the founders of, of PayPal, a uh, really successful entrepreneur and investor. It's very likely that one channel is optimal. Most businesses actually get zero distribution channels to work. Poor distribution, not product, is the number one cause of failure. If you can get even a single distribution channel to work, you have a great business. If you try for several but don't know when you're finished. What do you guys think of that? Better get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole, like, you know, you just need to build a better mousetraps. Not true. You know, I mean, you can have the greatest product, but if you don't have a way to get it to customers in, in a way that they can buy it cost effectively, um, the product's not going to work. So really, this is... Uh, focusing on traction is extremely important. And the rule of thumb they put forward is spend 50% of your time on traction and 50% of the time on product development. And they break it down into three phases. First one's making something people want. Phase two is marketing something people want. And then phase three is scaling your business. So the framework's pretty simple. Um, there's a, a lot of value in the book um, going into detail on in each one of these different strategies. So that's what we'll cover in the presentation. 
So we'll just kind of think about how you can use these for your business um, and, and apply it to, to different marketing opportunities. And then how it would fit in the bullseye framework to, to apply that strategy to your business. All right, so first one, viral marketing. I think we've all heard of this. Um, there's a few different types of viral marketing, your basic word of mouth. Um, then there's some that are built into the product. So there's some inherent virality into using like Skype or any messaging uh, technologies that get better as you share it with other people. And in order to use the technology, other people need to be um, brought onto the system. Um, collaboration, so like with Google Docs, it gets more effective if you're able to share it with other people. Some communications, um, sent from my iPhone or sent from my Blackberry, you see on that put on the bottom of emails, and so that lets people know, oh, that person's got an iPhone or some, some other phone. Um, sometimes you've got incentives built in. Dropbox has been really successful with that, but you see a lot of ones where it's like, you get extra storage space if you share with your friends, or extra points, or, or whatever. Um, some virality is embedded with YouTube, making it really easy to share um, videos. And then there's some social virality with, uh, you know, Spotify. You can let your friends know what songs you're listening to and stuff. Um, Chow Now is a pretty cool startup that helps um, set up online ordering for restaurants. Um, but they are really integrated with uh, social media. So when you order something, then you can post what you ordered really easily on social media. And so uh, um, a formula for measuring virality is, is this virality coefficient. So that's K. And it's invite sent. Per, per new user, so somebody you sign up, how many friends do they invite? All right, so that's that piece times the conversion rate. So how many of those people that they invited actually join or buy something? And if it's greater than 0.5, that's great. And so that really has an impact on your cost of customer acquisition. If you're able to get every customer you, you bring on brings on, on average, half of a new person, right? Or you bring on two customers and then you get another new one. Um, and so forth, that can really drive um, your, your user base. Viral cycle times, another interesting factor is like how fast are people sending these invites? So YouTube has a really short cycle time and stuff gets shared from YouTube really quickly, but then it dies down. Uh, but anyway, it gets really far really fast. Um, one of the keys to having a good um, coefficient here is, is thinking about how your site works as, as, a, as a leaky bucket. So you're probably not gonna get 100% of people that go to your site to sign up or something like that. But there's probably some people that are following out because they don't understand your site um, or something's not converting them. That would be a leaky bucket. Basically, you've got people going to your site but then they're not converting. And so by really just thinking about all these different ways people kind of fall out of your sales channel, uh, can improve your conversion rate and also improve your viral coefficient. And so just over time, you want to optimize that to uh, make it really easy for users to share invites and then also make it really effective for those invites to actually convert to users. Um, go back to the Dropbox example. This is a really good example of how they use viral marketing to basically build a business. They started with search engine marketing. And they, it was costing them $230 to acquire a customer for their $99 service. So remember we talked about last week. Lifetime value's really got to be above that coca, and in this case it's not. So basically they would be marketing and losing money um, as they do that. So that wasn't sustainable. They changed their focus to viral marketing, and everybody's seen these type of things that use Dropbox, where you can get up to 16 gigabytes free space uh, by sharing with your friends. Um, so people are rewarded and incentivized to share, and that, can really, that really drove a lot of growth and made Dropbox a leader in a space that um, was quickly becoming kind of a commoditized space. Um, and then by getting a lot of people on there, then it becomes the easiest way to share files with people and it really drove their business to success. All right. Any questions on viral marketing? I think it's important that like, not only do you have to get people to spread the word for you, but you actually have to have that conversion component. Because I think that lots of times you get the publicity out there, you get people to like talk about your thing, but then if you don't have a good way of converting them, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's where you really got to think through this whole kind of life cycle. How, the, not just that somebody else is invited, but what does that invite message say? Mm -hmm. Or if they 
tweet it, what's the auto-generated tweet look like? Is it something that would actually bring somebody on board? And as you optimize that over time, that just hopefully gets better and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Uh, number two is public relations. Um, this is just trying to get things published with, in news articles, blogs, publications, using press releases. And some tactics to getting in there, it's actually easier than you think um, to get PR because you've got uh, reporters that are, are writing um, a lot of stories, they're always under te deadlines, and they're always looking for interesting content. What they're probably not going to do is write the story for you and like really do an in-depth interview until you have more notoriety and um, something more uh, public, I guess. Um, but when you're just getting started, if you're able to find an angle that makes your story compelling and then really present that pitch succinctly and clearly to a reporter, um, then you might be able to get their interest and they might publish it for you. Um, really thinking about helping a reporter out, there's actually a service called Help a Reporter Out, H-A-R-O, that you can sign up for under different uh, expertises or topics to say, okay, when you've got a story about um, social media marketing, I'll be an expert that, that you can contact. And so then that's how you get your name in that article saying, social media expert says such and such. Um, so there's some things like that. Um, really making it easy for that um, reporter or journalist to convert that into a new story is really the, the key to getting them to pick your story up. And really, you know, understanding um, what would be a, a compelling story and positioning it appropriately. You also want to target the appropriate outlet that would, it usually publishes things that um, you're trying to cover or, or that your story is about so it's relatable. And then once you have a solid story, story, you can leverage it. You can submit it to community sites with larger audiences, social media, share with industry influencers and blogs. Um, sometimes it, that first press release then can go out to a lot of other people and actually be able to spread your story. You can even follow up with um, how we did this articles. If the first story was really successful, then uh, maybe some people want to learn about how you, how you actually pulled that off. Um, unify your message. You don't want to leave this up to interpretation about how your uh, business is presented. You need that to be um, really clear because that's your branding, that's the way your, your business is going to be positioned, and you don't want every journalist that touches the story to frame it a different way. So be really clear um, about the message you're trying to push and then particularly how your business is positioned. And then stories filter up. So it may take some time for you to get into a big publication, but if it's a compelling story, it will work its way up especially if you keep pushing it. All right. There's also, any questions on PR? There's also another type of PR called unconventional PR. And so you can see here, this is Richard Branson. He's um, pretty famous for any time he's launching a new product or business, and he launches a lot of different products and businesses, he does something crazy. And he does that because that makes it an event, that makes it a story. Um, you, can, you can see him here doing all kinds of different stuff. And every time it was, oh, look what Richard Branson did here, but it also made his new product or service um, really well publicized too. So that was always positioned forefront too. So Richard Branson launches Virgin Galactic by doing this, and they get a great picture out of it. So this can be useful. You can figure out a way to do it. Um, this is a, a good example of how a business that was trying to compete with PayPal did it, is it was a, uh, it was actually at PayPal's developer conference, right? So a lot of people that use PayPal understand exactly how it works. And um, they were creating a business that addressed an issue with PayPal, which was PayPal could freeze your account. And so what they did is they had a 600 pound block of ice that they dropped in front of this developer conference. So everybody that went there saw it, there was something to talk about. They already they told TechCrunch that they were going to do it, so then the article went out right away, and so then it, it put this uh, this WePay business on the map. He's in kind of an un unconventional PR, but really kind of made a splash. It's a, it seems like the unconventional PR would be hard to test for on the bullseye method. <laughs> That's true. Maybe at a small conference, yeah, and then you do it at the big one, or just do like a smaller version of the bullseye system or something, yeah. <laughs> Some ice cubes and you had them out and drinks. Oh, that was pretty funny. Yeah. 
Yeah, it might be a little, a little more difficult to test. Um, but you could try on a, on a small scale and then maybe do it on a broader scale. And you see some of these companies, I think, make a reputation for doing it over and over again. So maybe that's how they test it. It works once and then they just become known for doing something. Right, you don't hear about that one again because they didn't do it a million times. It didn't work the first time. Yeah. All right. Uh, number four, search engine marketing. Um, this is basically where you see the ads on... Um, uh, when you Google something, based on uh, your search, you'll get prompted with some different ads. And these are some examples for archives.com. Uh, they used search engine marketing before they got acquired by Ancestry.com for $100 million. And what they used it for was to get early customer data in a really controlled and predictable manner. And it was pretty interesting the way they were able to do it. At their peak, they were spending six figures a month on search engine marketing, placing these search engine ads. What they did is they tested different campaigns to find out what direction to take their product. So a lot of these family tree sites or archives have access to a lot of data, but what they really wanted to figure out is what did people want to do with that data. And so they use these marketing techniques as a way to do market research. So you're asking questions to find out if you're related to a celebrity or get access to census data. Uh, all kinds of different things. And you can start to see which, one, which ones are getting the most clicks, which ones are converting, which ones are cost effective. And by doing that, it uncovered what was interesting people about getting access to, to archives. And so then they were able to steer their product in a direction that really appealed to customers. And then it led to a pretty successful acquisition. Any questions on search engine marketing? Did they have a like direction for their product before that? I'm not sure. I mean, they didn't. It's not apparent in the name. Archives.com is just like a bunch of documents, right? So they didn't steer it any direction there. Um, we'll say like yeah, like a technology or something, and you're like, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. There's like try a different, lot of different marketing ways and see what works for it. Yeah. yeah I think there's some neat ways to use this. Uh, and search engine ads, depending on your uh, search terms, are not are not terribly expensive. So you can test these out on a small scale, and then by the time they were spending six figures a month, they knew which terms were working. And then at that point, then they just invest big in those and make sure that they convert to get the user base that then led to the acquisition. So this is a, this is a pretty neat strategy, one for getting customers, but also for, for doing market research. It can be really powerful. So remember that when you've got a product that um, doesn't really have a clear market niche or need or marketing channel. Um, you might be able to just try out a bunch of stuff. And I'm sure they had a lot of fun brainstorming all the different, <laughs> different ads that you put on, on, on Google. All right. Uh, number five, social media, social and display ads. Um, <coughs> see, the, see these things as banner ads. And usually the way these work best is they're not just in your face selling. It's usually like, IBM's doing this cloud stuff, discover the truly open cloud, right? So click here to learn more about it. And it's more about creating an environment within a social context that's geared towards the specific product or service um, you're trying to offer, or offer. And you're trying to build an affinity on this, the website that these show up on or on um, social media, and then build that loyalty, and then migrate the audience towards some conversion element um, at a later point in time. So these don't really work as like, by now, by now, um, dropped on every single page. But they want to inform you about, you know, some new product when you scan Snap, uh, or basically just build brand awareness. Um, and you just think about how users interact with banner ads or social media ads. A lot of times, reading a news article, you see some other ad, you read it, you get the information, but you're probably not likely to click on it because you went to the page for something else. So really just kind of use this to, to build brand awareness and then hopefully attract them to your site with some more like inbound tactics that, that interest them over the site. Um, these are some good examples of how to use the social ads um, as, a, as a branding tool more so than conversion. This also uh, involves something, things like commercials and things like that or who will be involved in these? Like TV commercials? Um, I think that goes under another category. But a lot of times it is the, the 
similar tactic. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, TV commercials, you're probably not going to get a direct response, um, but a lot of it is just building brand awareness. Okay. For example, I was remembering the this uh, when you were talking about that, like the awareness of I was, for example, the the Pepsi Coca Cola that that they're in the every girl like opens up one of each and they oh I got a free ticket I got a name yeah. Like, so like, I don't know if that includes in that like trying to show you what my brand can do compared to the other brands. Mm -hmm. It's basically that. Yeah, they're trying to kind of prime you for then making a decision at some future point. You know, so then you pick this soda over the next one because of, um, brand awareness or some some reason for you liking that brand more than you like. Yeah. yeah, so this is definitely a similar idea. Um, you see these examples, these come from LinkedIn, and so Ernst & Young is uh, um, mainly an accounting firm, they do business consulting, and you can see they've got some posts here, it's, it's sponsored, it says two-thirds of organizations face increased threats, but over a third have no real-time insight on cyber risks, right? There's no sales pitch there, it's just uh, some stats that might be informative to uh, businesses, um, and large businesses that might be susceptible to some cyber threats. And so how do you think that positions um, Ernst & Young by uh, put, paying to have these type of ads on a LinkedIn feed? People will see them as an expert in cybersecurity or cyber threats. Yeah, exactly. So the position is an expert. Um, they, didn't, they didn't overtly ask for, you know, come hire us to do consulting. But they position themselves as an expert, and then they're offering their annual global information security survey. Further position themselves as an expert. So then when you read this, and then you're convinced that there really is this big threat, who are you going to turn to for an answer? Maybe you're saying, they're, not, they're the ones that do these surveys and find out these risks. Um, so I think this is a really clever way to use social media. You see, they get a lot of engagement. Um, Granger sells... Um, parts for uh, manufacturing companies, uh, a lot of metal tools and things like that. And they've got one talking about manufacturing in, Mer in America and uh, just some infographics about it. And so why do you think they would put this, uh, this ad out? Helps them sell tools. Yeah, so there, it's an ad talking about how great this industry is that happens to be their customer segment. All right, so people in the manufacturing industry are uh, probably going to look at this favorably. Um, and it's just a way, in a way to get to engage with the customers. I think it's interesting they both kind of like posit a question. To yeah. Them. Yeah, I think they're all trying to start some type of discussion. That obviously makes their sponsored ads go a little bit further. And it seems to be pretty successful in getting that discussion engaged, which is kind of key to get that virality for yeah. those ads, too. Yeah, definitely. So I think these are pretty good examples on the social ads. There's a lot of different ways to use these, and, and usually it's just about getting creative about how are people engaging with the platform you want to market on, and then how can you target a specific audience, and then what can you do to engage them. And it's usually not as simple as just replicating somebody else. Uh, you really kind of think about what would be engaging, what would make you stand out, and help achieve whatever marketing goal you have. All right. Um, number seven, search engine optimization. This differs from search engine marketing because rather than paying for ads to pop up at search terms, you're actually optimizing your site so it ranks high. So your site comes up not as an ad, but as a search result. Um, the most important thing on this is your ability to rank on the first page should be a deciding factor when pursuing an SEO strategy. In most cases, when people are looking to buy something or um, for a specific business or product or something like that, if you're on the second page, um, the number of eyeballs that see that are significantly lower. And so what you want to consider is what um, search terms would you be able to afford? You've got um, the top 100 keywords that are getting hit millions of times a month. And then you've got these long tails where you've got a lot of other search terms that are not hit millions of times, but they're hit several times consistently uh, 
monthly. And what's interesting about those is that you can rank highly for some of these long tail characteristics a lot more easily than you can for the top ones. <clears throat> and so as a startup, you don't need a million customers. You know, you need 10, 100. You need to get started somewhere. And so working to optimize for some of these long tail care, uh, keywords uh, can be a really sound strategy um, to get some traffic to your business in a less competitive way. Because if you rank for a lot of these different long tail terms, it could be enough to move the needle for your company, but maybe not a bigger company, so they're not pursuing it. Less competition. Um, so I think that's a really good lesson there. <clears throat> Right. Any questions on SEO? There's a really good um, guide from Moz, M-O-Z. Um, they do uh, a lot of different tools to help you optimize your site, and they've got some guides for how to teach you how to do search engine optimization. I think you can connect really well, like if you have a really good value proposition that like answers a problem statement. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I just constantly these days type, type in Google instead of like trying to look for something specific. I just type out literally what I'm thinking, like, I don't like carrying my bag, and like see what comes up, and, yeah. and, and those are going to be a lot cheaper terms than yeah. like, you yeah. know, um, lighter bag. Yeah. So, mm. I just think it's really interesting, like I think the strength of the search engines make these more realistic too, to actually get some results on. Yeah. Yeah, I think I should correct myself, I said more expensive, really it's just more competition, because optimizing your site's free. Um, you need to work at it and do a lot of things, but for the most part, um, it's a free strategy. You're not paying to be ranked higher. Um, you'd pay if you wanted an add-on, uh, but these long tail ones are not going to have as so much competition, so it would be easier for you to rank there. Um, it may cost some money to actually use some tools to get the SEO going, but for the actual, for the search engine, you can't pay to get ranked higher. I don't think. Uh, number eight is content marketing. This is basically like your site has content that's interesting to people. That brings them on your site. Ideally, um, the people you brought on your site are your customers and you can convert them at a later time. So an example for phase one, so remember that was making something people want, um, that first step there. Um, there's a, a company called Unbounce that does uh, I think it was SE, landing page and conversion optimization. Um, I think it was an off like web marketing business. <clears throat> what they did is they began their blog a year before they launched. A lot of different articles about how to optimize landing pages, enhance conversion rates, make your website more effective. Um, and so what it allowed them to do is by the time that they did launch their product, a year later they had a 5,000 person email list. So as soon as they were able to launch, they had a lot of people that they built trust with, they built loyalty, they provided a lot of value over that year, and then uh, when the product came out, a lot of people were excited, and they were able to convert a lot of customers quickly. And what's really neat about it is the content still drives traffic. So this is where content marketing is different than buying ads, is that ads are temporary, whereas these, this content may be a little more difficult to create, but it's more of an asset that you own that can continue to drive traffic. <coughs> Giveaways like ebooks and courses, you see a lot of uh, companies do that. Usually, if you target your ebooks or courses um, to your target customer, that can be really strong. You can position yourself as an expert, um, which is an effective marketing strategy. And also, just engage your target customer that way. Rather than having to pay for their attention, you provide something of value. And then it usually is easier to convert a, a, a a customer after you deliver value to them than, than before you. So again, position uh, at as an as an expert, uh, deliver value, and then it gave the users things to share, which then helped get the name of their business out there. Another example, this is a little later, so that phase three of scaling your business. <coughs> uh, a company called OKCupid, after doing this, was acquired by Match.com for $50 million. They were an online uh, dating site. And their goal was to somehow differentiate in this pretty competitive space. They wanted to make it okay to talk about online dating. Uh, their SEO and then viral channels were tapped out because they weren't converting anymore. That's one of the lessons that you'll see with that bullseye framework is that not, these channels won't work forever. 
So eventually, you'll need to repeat that that bullseye strategy as your as your product um, evolves and then your target customers grow. Um, so anyway, they waited through uh, those first three channels. Those weren't converting anymore. They wanted to find something new. They tried to market through a PR firm that didn't really work because it wasn't authentic content and they weren't creating it. And so what they did is they tried a blog. And what they did on their blog articles was they um, basically leveraged the data that they had in their system. And so by doing that, they had really unique insights. They were the experts in that space, so they could write articles about exactly what to say in your first message. They had all the statistics on that. What was the most effective first message um, when you're fighting a new online date? And you can see how effective it was for them. It, grow, uh, it helped their, their user base grow from 1 million to 5 million users. Um, pretty quickly, too, over a year and a half or so. So this was a uh, you know, strategy that really made a difference for them and led to a, a great acquisition. All right. A lot of ways to use content marketing. Sometimes it's called inbound marketing. Any questions on this? It's pretty cool because it flips the dynamic a little bit, kind of like how we talked about last session, about like you could offer your service and then like uh, contingent on meeting some expectation, get paid for it. And it kind of does that, like you offer a free service, build, build trust, build credibility, and then Okay, now you see value in what I'm doing, so become a customer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and you start to build that relationship with your customers, so then the sales a lot easier. Yeah, I think this is a really powerful strategy. And it appeals, it's a lot more appealing to the customer than just that hard sell from the beginning. Generally, you get less resistance when you're offering something of value to the customer. <clears throat> and when you can leverage some insight that you have, like, um, OK Keep it was able to do their blog is actually called OK Trends. So it all leveraged data that they've been able to mine from their system as they already had a million users, so they had a good data source. And those kind of analytics were a way to differentiate from the other sites. All right, number nine, email marketing. Um, what's cool about email marketing is it's free. Uh, free to send messages, generally. Sometimes you have platforms that can get more expensive to send a lot of messages, but for the most part, each message is free. <clears throat> it's personal. A lot of the messages show up next to friends and family and other emails or messages that you're, you're looking for. Um, it's really I, only for, for reaching customers that have expressed an interest in your product. Spamming people does not work, right? So you, you need to be able to get them to say, like, hey, I want to be on your mailing list, and then you can market to them. So your key is to build this uh, this mailing list. You know, have some events, take down people's names, and add them to your email list. Ask them if they want to be <coughs> landing pages, um, getting emails for current customers, and uh, you can see here. This is um, for that Moz uh, search engine optimization site. See, once they uh, optimize their landing page and their email promotion. That a huge spike in, in mailing the subscribers. So just small tweaks here can get a lot more emails. Most of the time, it's just you need to ask for it and have a good way of capturing it. And uh, then you can build an email list that's just going to continue to grow over time. And it's a, um, a really valuable thing that you can continue to market to. Um, getting effective email campaigns is really important. So you don't get Tons of data, but you have data that can give you some actionable items. So you can see these analytics here for a uh, mailing list campaign where you've got an open rate and a click rate. So open rate is going to be in response to whatever your subject line was. Um, if somebody wants to open an email, they usually open it based on their subject line or some like first few lines in the message. And so if that's good, then you know your subject line is good. And usually you want some call to action in that email. And so that's where that click rate comes in. And so if you uh, get somebody to open it, then the click rate's good. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, you should move the camera over there. <laughs> um, so if the click rate's good, then you know that your, your content um, is converting. So by interpreting these analytics and knowing how to do that, gradually you can refine it so you're your email campaigns are optimized, your subject lines are good, your messages are effective, 
um, and you're actually getting those conversions. So after you built this email list, you're able to convert um, the people on your list to uh, paying customers. Um, here's some examples of landing pages. A lot of time, uh, I mean, a good place to start with landing page designs is any company that's raised millions of dollars, or in some cases billions of dollars, like um, Uber, look at their sites because they're probably doing it the most effective way. They've had a lot of money invested in how do you convert users, and so their landing pages um, are designed pretty effectively. And you can see these two, Lyft and Uber, really similar services, both have almost identical landing pages. Um, so you want to become a driver, or do you want to get rides, right? There's basically those two options for marketing to. And I did this presentation a while back, and check again the landing page. Lyft is pretty much the same still, but Uber now looks like this. So I wanted to know, why do you, why do you guys think Uber changed their landing page from this to this? Well, you don't have to click on another, you don't have to open anything, you can enter all of your information on that first screen. Yeah, so they decrease some steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> they try to show, uh, like give a little promotion of friendly writing, like if you're getting like picture of the passenger with the, with the driver mm -hmm. uh, together, like it shows a, a like, Look, we are friendly here. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of the another one that was just a person getting out of the car. Yeah. And they're both happy. They're both, yeah. I mean, win win. Whether uh, you're a driver or a passenger, that's true. they're yeah. both going to come out ahead. Yeah. I think their target audience change. <clears throat> and they're not trying to, <clears throat> they're not trying to appeal to the younger demographic anymore. Because the gentleman, dri the driver, is an older guy. Mm -hmm. The younger guy's already there. And the older demographic may like be less inclined to just do something with one click, but do something that would have more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think all those those points are right. I think this was this was probably a year ago or so, and, and so I think their target market's changed. I think they probably already have. It, it, at first, Uber came out as you know exclusive. You know, you'd write Uber Black, Uber XL, and all those mm -hmm. different things. Um, and it was kind of that exclusive ride. Now it's moving towards more mainstream. And so I think they, they transitioned from the black theme uh, on the colors here to make it look exclusive um, to something that's more, uh, more of a mainstream type thing. And then trying to appeal to a different customer segment. Because I think they've already got that initial customer segment um, secured. And then also, yeah, I think that is a good point with the uh, um, sign up is that you can do it just right on that page. So they decrease the number of clicks, which is another thing that you see on landing pages is making it simple to convert. So I thought that was pretty interesting. They ended up keeping the same thing. Their picture's a little different, but the site's pretty much exactly the same. Um, and so anyway, when you're thinking about landing pages, you can look at um, what else is out there, and particularly ones that have spent a lot of money on it and are successfully converting customers, um, you want to uh, um, you want to try to emulate those and, and learn from, from what they do. Uh, there's also some great tools. We use some of them. Um, there's one called Sumo Me that uh, um, builds these little mailing list pop-ups, little things that after you know a certain amount of time or the first time that you uh, view the site in a couple of uh, um, you know, every couple of weeks it's going to pop up with a message to join the mailing list. Um, and it's really easy to integrate to WordPress and things like that. And so what they say, 10, 10 times your SEO traffic, um, there's a lot of different tools when you add on that, that uh, Sumo Me that you can plug in that then are going to help more people join your mailing list than in your business. So there's some great tools out there for that kind of thing. And that's really about building that mailing list so then you can have an effective emailing. Okay. All right, any questions about email marketing? All right. Um, some other things to think about here, this is kind of interesting where um, it's not super effective to just sell, sell, sell on email marketing either. In some cases you want to, lead nurturing is more effective. 
And it's basically um, taking your buyer through some different stages. So um, converting them to customer and then eventually a champion of your product based on different messages. And there's some things called uh, marketing automation, different tools you can get that as uh, um, so they don't just get your monthly newsletter, they'll get a, a prescribed series of emails to guide them directly through these, these channels to a converting customer. So your first emails might be somebody signs up for a free service on your website, you send them some emails so they to teach them how to use it, so they can get the, the full value out of your site. Um, maybe add some different tips later, and then um, maybe send them notices when their use goes to a point where they're about up to a point where they might need to pay, say, hey, you're, you're at your limit, sign up for this um, paid service or something like that. And so then based on the user actions and how they engage with those emails, um, they'll get a different different list. So those marketing automation channels are really, really powerful. Uh, especially when you think about each email you send is free, you design that system and each customer, once you refine it, is going to go through that same pathway and get brought all the way to the point where they get sold. Um, automatically, so you're not having to directly sell. So those can be really powerful too. All right, some other ones, um, offline ads. So these would be TV ads, billboards. Um, <coughs> TV ads can be a little difficult for startups generally, but uh, billboards, um, print media. Sometimes you can get these things called remnant ads, where if a magazine's about to go to print, you can get the ads. 90% discount because there's just space in a magazine that you could fill. <clears throat> so those could be a potential channel for your business. Engineering is marketing. is basically you design um, apps or widgets or tools that would be interesting to your target customer. And then you uh, um, put those out there for free as a way to get people to your site. And then it's kind of like a content marketing strategy, but instead of just being text content, um, it's usually some app or widget or something like that. Targeting blogs can be really effective, um, especially because most blogs have a really tight target customer. So if you know <clears throat> who the target customer is for a specific blog, and if that's your target customer, getting featured on that blog can be a really quick way to get access to, uh, to your ideal market, basically. And really what you need there is just to convince the blog writer to um, write something favorable or share it. And ideally, if it's something that's really interesting to target customers, the blog writer would want to share it. And so this strategy was used by, um, his name was Noah, Noah Kagan. He was actually the guy that founded Sumo Me after that, uh, after working at Mint. He used this strategy so that the Mint.com, that site for um, pulling on all your bank accounts so you can manage your finances, um, he used uh, personal finance blogs as a way to roll that out. So when they launched the app, they had 20,000 users um, at launch, which is pretty incredible. That's how I found out about Mint. It was, it, yeah. it was reading a Yahoo article. I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. So it was probably on Yahoo, MSN, USA, and mm -hmm. all the big ones. Yeah, so he's got a list here. So he, he looked at um, how much traffic each one of these gets, an estimated click-through rate, conversion, and then total users to then tally up how many users they thought they could get. <clears throat> I mean, it was really effective because it was something that most people reading personal finance blogs mm -hmm. would want this would want this thing. Um, and I think it was they did something about um, you had to be invited or something like that to got people onto the uh, Mint.com. Um, and it was really impressive is that they launched in 2007. And in 2009, they're required for 170 million by Intuit, so the one that makes uh, all the QuickBooks software. Uh, it's really fast <laughs> to create that much value. Um, business development is another strategy. And Half.com, uh, they sell books, textbooks, audiobooks. Um, now they're an eBay company. Um, but their goal was when they launched, they, they knew their site would only be cool if they had a lot of stuff on there. You didn't want to have a big launch and then people are looking for books and there's like 10 books on there or something like that. So their goal was to have a million um, inventory items on day one. And so they built partners with um, all kinds of inventory partners, technology partners, distribution partners. So when they launched, they, they had a lot of um, inventory. And so that's business development, making partnerships. 
uh, to be able to launch your business. <clears throat> uh, Twelve is, is sales. Pretty straightforward, just direct sales, personal selling. Maybe the way to initially get traction through a product. Um, the best way to use direct sales is as a market research tool. So as your salespeople are talking to people about how uh, uh, about the products and getting them to buy them, you start to figure out what are the most effective sales techniques, what do customers think about your product, and so forth. And so eventually you move into a more automated um, sales process later. All right, affiliate programs. Um, these are really powerful. Um, lead generation is actually a $26 billion industry, so it's a huge industry, but it's um, not usually up front, so a lot of people don't understand it. <clears throat> Basically the way it works is um, you have a website that refers clients to another website to go buy something, and the, the referring website ends up getting a percentage of the sales commission. So you can sign up with the Amazon Associates. Um, a lot of those blogs that do product reviews, this is how they make money. Because when somebody clicks through from that blog to buy something, um, the blog owner would get um, a percentage of the sale. And Amazon, once you get up to scales, uh, up to 10% uh, of the sales could be pretty significant there. <coughs> and so the, the way these, these work as a traction channel is that you can actually set up your own affiliate programs so then you empower all these blog writers or whoever would drive traffic to your website to bring clients to your, your business for 3% of the sale, 5% of the sale, whatever would be enough to make it attractive. Any questions on these? These, these are pretty cool. You see, um, this is a way to monetize businesses that sometimes are pretty difficult to monetize. Blogs and things like that. <coughs> All right, so the last, uh, last five. Existing platforms can be a traction channel. Um, here's a chart here of this app, Train Your Express and their downloads. Uh, before they were featured on the uh, front page of the App Store. So going up, huge spike as soon as they just got recognized. So really using those existing platforms to grow their business. <coughs> Evernote's kind of been a leader on basically every app ecosystem that went out, whether it was Blackberry or Android, um, they built an app, so they were one of the first ones on those platforms. So when people got a new phone um, for one of those ecosystems, Evernote was always the early one to, to download. And it was expensive as far as development, but it also uh, um, drove some, some acquisition on the uh, popular ecosystems. You can hold trade shows or offline events to bring together um, target customers. Um, a business that had a product for self-funded startups put together MicroConf, um, the conference for self-funded startups, to bring together a lot of their customer segments. They could do market research there, they could do sales, um, and they provided value by having an interesting con conference that um, brought those people together. Um, and so that's a way to uh, get traction. Speaking engagement, again, that's about positioning yourself as an expert. <clears throat> and then community building. Stack Overflow is uh, a site for, for handling uh, programming problems. For ba basically any computer programming language, if you've got a problem, you post it on Stack Overflow and then some expert will, will answer it. And it's all community driven. And it's grown a lot to the point they actually need to build a meta forum, which is like a forum about the forum. <laughs> Where, and then it gets heated on there, supposedly. Um, so then once you build a community, add a meta forum, so then the community can kind of run with it and take ownership of it. So those can be pretty powerful to be able to, be able to build a, a strong community around your product. All right, so the takeaways. Key success for your startup depends on your ability to find a traction channel. Uh, no traction channel will work forever, and so you want to continually repeat this bullseye method as your existing tra 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 traction channels um, get used up or, or kind of lose their effectiveness. And you want to consider all options and then use this as an opportunity to differentiate. All right, any questions? Highly recommend the book. It's got some great strategies for um, how to do a lot of these different marketing techniques 
if you want to dig in there and get a little more examples. <coughs> Got some questions for you. Any memorable, memorable acquisition strategies you can recall? So we're all customers. Um, can you think of any businesses that had a unique acquisition strategy to, to bring in? I remember seeing on um, internet it was a like a burger's place and in front it had a, a sign that said like come and try the burger that one person on Yelp say that it was the worst burger in the world. No. Oh. Uh, and the fact that somebody posted that picture <coughs> on the internet that wasn't like from that building, so basically like that I think that was a really good idea of like in a fun way that you know, like make make customers like I try cost customers yeah sure like let's try it. <laughs> the worst yeah that's funny that was a way to um, get people engaged yeah that's pretty interesting. All right, any others? What about any ideas for using these channels to grow your business? Which ones do you think would be most effective? I think it depends on what stage your business is in. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in development or startup or if you have an active business trying to, to grow that. So mm -hmm. the blogging for you know something that hasn't launched versus the email for existing customers and different types of bullseyes. So Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely <clears throat> All right, well, these are the 19 channels. Um, if you go to tractionbook.com, you can download, I think, the first three chapters for free. Those cover the um, <coughs> bullseye method and more detail about how to do those. And then if you want, you can buy, uh, buy the book. It goes through. It's basically a manual for how you do each one of these tracking channels. So highly recommend it. Um, just want to do a plug for the Aggie Startup Club. You can sign up at arrowheadcenter.nmsu.edu slash startup. Uh, they meet twice a month. Uh, you can join on there and then also see the upcoming meetings. Launch is open right now for students and faculty. Um, it's a chance to win a $25,000 investment award. You need to apply by uh, November 9th at the Arrowhead website slash launch. And then we've got another networking hour next week, uh, Wednesday 2 to 3. Um, it's number five in the This One Entrepreneurship series and it's about how to design and build your product. And as always, you can subscribe to it to all our events on our Facebook page and check out um, these events live and past recordings there as well. So thanks for coming. Enjoy the pizza and we'll see you next week.